And good evening, y'all. Let's get can get we have get seated. We'll go ahead and get started tonight. Glad to see you back tonight. If you was not in discipleship training, you missed a blessing. So be make plans to be part. We got some great evening classes. Come be a part of that. I'm just going to highlight a couple of announcements tonight. Don't forget. Let's see the Tennessee missions and the golden offering. We're still at Miss Betty's changing as we speak. We're going to get a grand. 776 as of tonight. All right, 776. So we still have time to give. Make plans to give if you have not given for that yet. Also, don't forget this Wednesday night is the monthly business meeting. Come be a part of that. Also, don't forget next Sunday at 430 is the board of directors meeting. So make plans to be a part of that. We have new board members on there this year. So make plans, new board members to be there for sure. We'll get a great year started off. Also, don't forget, Tuesday, September the 18th at 10 o'clock is WMU. Is that right, Miss Betty? That is correct, right? Tuesday at 10 o'clock. All right, so come be a part of that, ladies. That's Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Also, let's see, the David Crowder Live uh, Union University is this Saturday night. Make plans to be there at 7 o'clock. Bring your lawn chairs. I know some of the youth are going. Uh, we're not sure exactly, but if, you, if we're going just yet, do the work, but we'll see. Hopefully we can. But make plans to be part of that concert if you can. Uh, they're a great band. You'll be blessed. You'll t and Brother Charles says he'll take pictures. Well, hopefully I'll be there. We'll see. We're going to see. We're going to be in Jackson, I think, at Wine anyway, celebrating somebody's birthday. But we shall see. Uh, and she is not here tonight. <laughs> anyway, are there any other announcements tonight? Any other announcements? If not, can I have the ushers, please? Can you pray, please? I told the youth tonight if they're going to the Crowder concert with us, we were going to meet at the church at 4, and we're going to go to eat. And as of right now, I have 13 students going. 13 students. Um, and I told them the deadline to sign up was Wednesday. Um, so 13 students right now. I, if I hope I have enough room. If not, little Charles might be driving his van. <laughs> so uh, that's what's going on there. You'll be praying for the students uh, next week and this week as See You at the Pole is coming up next Wednesday. It is student-led, but if you want to go out there, you can stand or behind the kids and pray over them. Um, I know I'll be at Halls. Um, Ollie and a couple others that graduated Halls, I think, last year are going to be doing some music for them. And then student, students are going to lead in some worship. Students are going to lead in some... Uh, Bible reading and some prayers. Um, so it's going to be a good time. You can come to Halls. It's right. If you're going to Halls, it's going to be right in front of the middle school. I believe that's where the flagpole is. And if you're going to Ripley, uh, I think the Halls is right there by the football field somewhere. I haven't seen it since I've been there. I think it's right around the football field somewhere. Um, so, so that's I'll be in Halls. If, if people want to go to Ripley, if people want to come to Halls, y'all are more than welcome. Just to pray over the students and pray over our country and the school system. Um, definitely be praying for the school systems. Um, some of you all heard the incident that happened in Ripley. So y'all be praying um, at the high school. So y'all be praying for our teachers and our schools too every single day. 
Are we ready to worship this morning, this evening? I'll keep you seated if you promise to sing out. Uh, so you can follow along in your hymn books to hymn 544, Have Thy Own Way, Lord. in him 258 258 blessed redeemer
Mr. Dodge, will you pray for our preacher as he comes forward? Amen. We're glad to be in God's house tonight. Amen. If you would take your Bible this evening and open up to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, as we continue our study, the title of this sermon is Apostolic Ministry, but it could also be entitled The Spirit-Filled Church, The Spirit-Filled Church. Jesus had told his disciples that they would be witnesses in Judea, Jerusalem, Samaria, and to the rest of the world. In Acts 1 and 8, we find but ye shall receive power, and after that the Holy Ghost came upon you, and ye shall be witnesses both unto me in Jerusalem, and all Judea, and Samaria, and in the uttermost parts of the earth. He promised that they would receive power by the Holy Ghost to perform miracles, signs, and wonders, to reveal the truth of the gospel to a lost and dying world. And through our text today, we see the beginning of that apostolic ministry in which God fulfilled his promise. When he told those apostles, you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I still believe that God heals today. I still believe that God performs miracles today. However, I do believe that the time of the apostolic ministry has ceased. And yet while that apostolic ministry has ceased, God's power to heal physically and spiritually has not. God's power to redeem has not. God's power to save has not. And God's power to change lives has not. And so we come to Acts chapter 5 and verses 12 through 16. And if you're there, say amen. It says, By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And the rest dared no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets, laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for tonight. God, we thank you for the challenge of your word. And we ask, God, you challenge us tonight. Say, God, if there be anything in our lives tonight that we need to get right with you, let it happen. God, what we need to do as a church, show us. How we need to respond, show us. God, we want to be a spirit-filled church. A church where your spirit overrides us. Your spirit pours out upon us. Where we are seeing people saved. Seeing people baptized. Seeing people put on the road to discipleship. God, we want to be a church that is growing. More than anything else, growing spiritually and growing physically. But more than anything, spiritually. God, we want to be a church that honors you. So let us be. Your word, your truth, your message, your people, 
for your Holy Spirit. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. As we begin our message tonight, I do not want us to lose focus of an overriding theme, an overarching theme that comes through the book of Acts in the first century church, and that, and that theme is unity. That theme is unity. We find that Luke once again writes, and they were all with one accord. They were all with one accord. They came together with a single focus, a single mindset, a single drive, a single desire, and they were one. We need to understand, and hear me out, church, the enemy wants to do nothing more than to divide us as a church. Amen? That's what he wants to do. He wants me to have you upset with me and me upset with you and us upset with one another. And he wants to divide the church because if he does that, he defeats us. Jesus speaking in Matthew 12 and 25, when he had cast out the demon and the Pharisees came up and said, well, that must have been done by Beelzebub. Jesus looks at him and he says, and Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And so if we as a church are to remain strong and we are to grow, it will be when we have unity and we're in one accord. Amen? That's how we grow, standing in one accord on the Lord. As we move forward within our church, we find another theme that has been brought forth throughout the book of Acts. And that's a threefold ministry of the testimony of the church in the first century. It involves the apostolic ministry, yes. But it is the testimony of a spirit-filled church. The testimony of a spirit-filled church. We find that the spirit-filled church will be unified. A spirit-filled church will be unified. They will be unified in one mind, in one body, in one accord. It says they were all with one accord in verse 12. As I said, Satan wishes to do nothing more than destroy unity within the church of God today. When he attacks a church, typically he doesn't attack a church from the outside. Why would he attack a church from the outside? It ain't going to do no damage. I mean, if somebody comes to my church and they try to attack my church, guess what? I'm going to stand up for the church, amen? I mean, that's just what's going to happen. It's the same way. You come at my family, guess what? You're going to have a six foot two, 350 pound man bow up on you. You leave my family alone. They're off limits. You, you don't mess with them, right? It's the same way with my church. Don't mess with my church. Brothers and sisters, when he attacks the church, he typically doesn't do it from the outside. He does it from the inside. He gets this person with this agenda, this person with that agenda, this gripe, this gripe, that fester, this gossip, and he destroys it from the inside like cancer. That's what Satan wants to do. So once again, I remind you that a house divided will not stand, and I encourage us to be unified in the blood of Jesus Christ, unified in a focus on Jesus, and unified in ministry. If you've ever watched any of the specials on the Animal Planet or Discovery, you see how the lion are on, is on the hunt, and they proceed in three ways. One, they proceed methodically. Two, they seek the weakest animal. And three, they separate that one from the pack. That's how the enemy does it. He does it methodically. He doesn't just show up one day and say, Hey, I'm going to wear you out. He finds the weakest people. He finds the weakest part in that church. And he tries to separate them from the pack. He wants to attack them. This is why Peter, his description of the enemy under inspiration of the Holy Spirit is so accurate and precise. When he says in 1 Peter 5 and 8, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil has a roaring lion walking to the bout, seeking whom he may devour. Church, if we're going to grow and we're going to be spirit-filled, we need to be unified. Amen? Unified. Unified. Not only was that first century church unified, but that church, the spirit-filled church, will be magnified. It was magnified. But the people magnified them in verse 13, it says. A church in the first century, the first century church was magnified. What does it mean by that? It was respected, it was honored, and it was revered. When they said the church in the first century, it was honored, it was respected, it was revered. One thought twice before joining the church even because of the respect 
and reverence and honor that it deserved. It said, and durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. So that what that wasn't saying, let me go ahead and tell you what that wasn't saying. It wasn't saying that the church in the first century wasn't growing. Because we know that to be a lie. In fact, we found something out in the book of Acts, praise God, and that's that Jesus don't add and subtract. God is a multiplier, amen? He multiplies the church. So it wasn't the fact that the church wasn't growing because it was growing by thousands of people at a time. It was growing by the multitudes. What it meant was that people thought twice before joining. It was not out of apathy or complacency, but it was out of fear. It wasn't because the people didn't care about the church. Oh, they cared about the church. They were afraid of what God was doing in the church. If you remember just at the beginning of Acts chapter 5, you got two members of the church, Ananias and Sapphira. If you remember what happened to them, God killed them on the spot for testing the spirit and lying to them. You don't think that shook some people up in the church and outside the church? Amen? I think we need to learn some respect in the church today. We need to realize this is God's house. Listen, I've been to churches where they had designated smoking sections right outside a door. I have been to churches where I've walked in and heard members, the leadership in a church, cursing in profanities over in a corner in a fellowship hall. When I walk in and all of a sudden they shut up and sit down. I've had all kinds of backbiting, all kinds of gossip, had all kinds of meetings before meetings to handle it and everything else and the church wasn't being, we had people that joined the church. I, that one joke about the person who said he had rat problems in the bottom of his basement. He said, well, how do we fix that problem? Went to the Methodist, he said, I don't know, we can't fix it. Went to the, the, the Presbyterian, said, I don't know, we can't fix it. The Baptist said, we got that fixed. They said, how's that? We baptized them all, made a member of the church, hadn't seen them since. And that's the typical progression in the church today. Brothers and sisters, we need to realize when we join the church, we are joining the bride of Christ. We're not just joining in a group of collection of people. We're part of the bride of Christ. When we drop the knee, bend the knee, and give our life to Christ, we're saying we're part of the family of Christ. You don't just disown your family, so why do we disown the church? Amen? Amen? We need to learn to respect the church. They respected the church. They were not going to join unless they were willing to pay the cost. While many in the U.S. look at the church as an option of convenience or even a way to gather political favor and advantage, it was different in the first century. Let us look, a few, let us look at a few facts. Claiming to be a Christ follower welcomed persecution, isolation, and physical loss. When you accepted Christ in the first century, you welcomed persecution, isolation, disownment, and physical loss. It was well apparent within the body of Christ that those who were dishonest and didn't keep their commitment to God in honest light could find themselves dead. Think about Ananias and Sapphira. Not only was the church magnified, but we also see a change in status of women within the church. You have to remember, we're dealing with the first century. Women were nothing in the first century. That was the perception. Nothing. They weren't taught. They weren't educated. They were considered a little more than baby makers. That was the perception of a first century woman. That's what we find in the Muslim world even still today. But when Jesus came on the spot, when the church came, the idea of women changed. Women were lifted up. Women within the first century, like I said, were very low esteem and respect. Most religions and cultures didn't even accept them, and yet in the Christian faith they did. Luke took great effort within both his writings to paint a great honor for women, and within the book of Acts alone, Luke mentions women at least a dozen times. She, he reveals that women had a place of honor in that apostolic church. For the first time within Scripture, we find testimony of women even being saved. In verse 14 of chapter 5, it says, And believers, the more were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. 
Brothers and sisters, we have to understand when the first century church got magnified, it changed the whole ball game. Amen? The first century church was a church of change. So many in the church today are afraid of change. We're afraid to change translations. We're afraid to change music. We're afraid to change how we do it. We're afraid to change the number of songs we sing. We're afraid to change how we sing. We have all these fear of change. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is a God of change. In the first century church was a church that changed things. We have to be willing to change and follow God. We can't be the frozen chosen. We can't just stay where we're at. God has called us to move and witness and change things. Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia reminding them that in Christ there was no distinction between men and women. Galatians 26 and 28 it says, For you're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we have to open our eyes to the fact that the first century church had a great respect for the church, had a great respect for women, had a great respect for their leadership, and were willing to go beyond the bounds of tradition to reach people for Christ. They were were barrier breakers. How many of us in the church today are willing to begin to respect the church once again? To love Jesus. To do what it takes to win people to Christ. It says the first century church was magnified, it was respected. Most atheists in the world today, when I talk to them or when I've seen things, they'll look at you and say, I ain't got no problem with your Christ, I got a problem with your church. And it's because the church isn't looking like Christ. We need to look like Christ. We need to be willing to go above barriers and bounds and reach people where they're at. Not only was the first century church unified, not only will that spirit-filled church be magnified, but that church will be multiplied. That church will be multiplied. In verse 14, And the believers were more added unto the Lord multitudes both of men and women. When God's moving in a church, it grows. Spiritually, it grows numerically. It grows. God did a mighty work within that first century church during that apostolic age. We find that written by Luke. It says, In so much that they brought forth the sick to the streets and laid them on beds and couches, at least the shadow of Peter passing by it might overshadow some of them. May I let you know, though, it doesn't say that Peter's shadow saved somebody. Or healed somebody. There's a lot of superstition there. It says that the people thought that. I'm not saying the people weren't healed. I'm just saying it wasn't about a shadow. It was about God that was healing people. Amen. It says there came also a multitude of the cities round about Jerusalem. Bringing sick folk. And then which were vexed and unclean spirits. And they were healed every one of them. It just wasn't the people in Jerusalem. It was the people all around Judea. That were coming to Jerusalem. And the whole area around them were coming in because God was moving. I have been in churches, people drove 45 minutes one way. One way. And they did it three days a week. They did it Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. They did it three, they did it three times a week. They would drive an hour and a half round trip. Hour and a half Sunday morning, hour and a half Sunday night, and an hour and a half Wednesday night. Just to be at church. And we have people finding it hard to drive 10 minutes around trip. Brothers and sisters, we've got to start realizing the importance of church once again. The importance of church once again and seeing God move and multiply. We find that the church grew and multiplied because of signs and miracles that the Lord was go- doing through the church. This truly was an apostolic sage and I, age because I say this was that age because, of, because we don't have apostles anymore. You have to understand that. These, the, the apostolic church, I normally don't bring out other denominations, but the reality of it is there's no such thing as apostles anymore. We have preachers and we have teachers. We do not have apostles. We have pastors. 
To be an apostle, you had to have a face-to-face encounter with Jesus. Acts 1 and 22, beginning from the baptism of John into the same day that was taken up from us, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of this resurrection. 1 Corinthians 91, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? Within that apostolic age, God used many signs and miracles to affirm their authority. Why were they having all the miracles? Why were they having all the wonders? Because it was to affirm their authority, to give them credence. In Romans 15 and 19, through through mighty signs and wonders, the power of God, or the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem round about Iricum, I have preached the gospel of Christ in 2 Corinthians 12 and 12. Truly the signs of the apostles were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. In Hebrews 2 and 4, God also bearing witness both signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Why would God use all those signs and wonders just to point to authority? Just to give them credence? Because the Jews required a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. It was to get to the people of God and say, look, these people are doing what I told you they would do. I'm working in their life. And we find that God would work through these signs and miracles and people getting saved. But those miracles opened doors for the gospel. Every time somebody was healed in the apostolic age, it was a witness and a testimony to the grace of Jesus Christ and lead to salvation. Even when Jesus healed in the, new, in, the, in the Gospels, he would go and tell them, what would he say, church? Go and sin no more. Your faith has made you whole. We have to understand God may heal through the physical realm, which he does. And I'm not saying that he doesn't, but he's healing physically to get to somebody spiritually. Amen? Brothers and sisters, our aim should not be just physical healing. Our aim should be somebody's spiritual healing. What good does it do for somebody to get physically healed and die and go to hell? They need to have a heart change more than they need to have a physical change. It's about saving people's lives. We do our Bible, we do our prayer requests, and I pray for those prayer requests every day. I go down that whole list and I pray every day. My list is longer than your list, probably at least it's printed out. I I flip that thing over and it's got more stuff written down on it. More names, more details. I've got, in fact, I mean, I can show you. I'm not blowing smoke. I add more details to it as people come along. And I pray through this list every day. But I also pray for people on here that need Jesus. Amen? Because I would rather be healed spiritually than physically any day of the week. Brothers and sisters, what is our focus as a church? Is it physical healing or is it spiritual healing? I want physical healing, but praise God, I want spiritual healing more than I ever want physical healing. It's about the Spirit. These people may have came for physical healing. They brought, the, they brought forth the sick, the sick folk. They were vexed with unclean spirits. They may needed physical healing, but they needed spiritual healing more than anything else. And believers were more added to the Lord, multitudes, both men and women. So I ask tonight, do you know Jesus? Do you really know Jesus? Are you playing, playing Russian roulette with your eternity? I said this before. I worked for a funeral home for two years. I picked up stillborn babies from a refrigerator in a break room. I picked up four-year-old kids that battled cancer for three years of their four years of life. I have picked up 14-year-olds, 12-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds, on up. Death is not concerned with your age or your health. Men and women, boys and girls, on up. Too many today are praying Russian roulette with their eternity. And the church is spending too much time praying for physical healing. 
and not enough time to do it, see? We need to be praying for people to get saved. Don't discount the fact they need physical healing. But at the end of the day, what's going to last them for eternity is their salvation. And the reality of it is none of us die. We may go to sleep. But every one of us in this house tonight and everybody outside this house tonight are going to have life for eternity. The question is, where are you going to spend your eternity? Are you going to spend your eternity in hell or your eternity in heaven? And it all comes down to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Where are we at? See, today, brothers and sisters, we don't test teachers by miracles. We test them by the spirit within them. Amen? There's a reason why Jesus said, test the spirits. The reason why John writes in 1 John 2 and 18 through 29 and 4 and 1 through 6, test the spirits. Because we already have that which is perfect. We got the word of God. We got the spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 13, 9 through 10 says, For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be made perfect. We've got the truth. It's right here. It's right here. I'm not saying God can't speak in tongues. The Bible says not to forbid it says that there will be some more than two or, more, two or three, and one should be an interpreter. I'm saying that more than likely in a group like this, we all speak English at some point in time. I'm not saying God doesn't heal physically. I have been called to people's houses and said, Brother Charles, I can't sit down. My back is locked up. Will you please pray for me? My associate pastor and I drove to this lady's house during Sunday school. James says, if this man comes and says he's ill, have the elders of the church lay hands on him. We laid hands on that young lady and prayed for her. And while we prayed for her, her back went from ice cold to fiery hot and started sweating. And she was able to come to church with us that day. I know that God still performs miracles. But every miracle that God performs is to point somebody to the love and the redemption of his blood, Jesus Christ. We need to get fearful when it comes to the God in the church. And we need to have a heart for the lost. And a heart for the lost. I close with this. When Jesus performed miracles, it was always a threefold purpose. To show compassion and meet human need. To present his credential as son of God. And to convey spiritual truth. The church's purpose nearly 2,000 years later is still the same as it was then. Our purpose was not derived from our own ambitions, but from the heart of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are to show compassion and meet human need. And the greatest human need of all is salvation in Jesus Christ. The only way to convince, convince, convey this truth, the spiritual truth, is through the gospel. And when Peter and John went to the temple beautiful, they saw a person in need. They showed compassion toward the lame man. They addressed his physical need and in spiritual need through the gospel message of Jesus Christ. And we're here to do the same. When that man looked at him and begging alms, Peter and James, or Peter and John looked at him and said, Look, silver and gold, I have none, but what I do have in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. They not only said stand up and walk, they grabbed that man by the hand, they helped him up, they picked him up, 
Brothers and sisters, we need to be telling people today, I may not have money, but I can help you, amen. I can help you in the name of Jesus. We can help you off drugs. We can help you off addiction. We can help you off alcoholism. We can help you out of poverty. We can help you out of depression. We can help you in, we can help you in the name of Jesus. And not only talk to them, but grab the hand and lift them up. And then what happened after that? All the people started around and said, what happened? What happened? And Peter and John looked at him and said, let me tell you what happened. Jesus happened. Brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but I'm waiting for Jesus to happen. Amen? That's what I want. I want Jesus to happen. If you want to change in your life, the only way it's going to change is Jesus. If you want victory, the only way it's going to happen is Jesus. Everybody stand, please. Every head bowed and every eye closed as Matt comes, as Miss Dorothy comes. The invitation's open. The altar is open. God, we thank you for this morning or this evening. We thank you for your grace. God, your, your invitation's open. It's your spirit that draws. It's your spirit that calls. How are we going to respond? And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.